Please. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership drummer, Michael Bland, best known as a member of Prince's New Power Generation Band and his subsequent work with the Superstar as well as Associated Acts. He has also carved out a very impressive career holding down the beat for a broad range of well-known artists, including Phil Upchurch, Foley, George Benson, Maxwell, Jeff Lee Johnson, Johnny Lang, Soul Asylum, Mandy Moore, Miley Cyrus, Indigenous, Nick Jonas, the Backstreet Boys, Clay Aiken, Demi Lovato, Boys to Men, Chaka Khan, Maceo Parker, Wolfpack and Corey Wong. Michael, how are you, man? <laughs> I'm great. I'm not sure if I deserve the honor of uh <laughs> I don't know, man. It's funny to hear it all run down like that, to hear your life given back to you in a, you know, in a list. It's like, wow. I I'm not sure sure exactly how all that happened, but I'm here. <laughs> well, I'm real glad you're here too. And where is here <laughs> uh for you right now as we're talking? Well, I'm I'm in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, which is where I've been living since probably 1994. Uh, I had I needed to buy a house closer to Paisley Park because uh, my ex-wife, my ex-wife, but my wife at the time, we got tired of commuting across the city. You know, <laughs> every day it was just like, I got to get closer to, to, to Paisley because I'm that's my almost my first home at this point, you know. So where I live was more of a place I went to to get away from work. <laughs> Not really, <laughs> you know, it was just kind of a place to decompress. And then I right back to the salt mines out there. But I, I live about 11 minutes away from Paisley. Okay. And uh, has it actually finally heated up there where you are? Because it's incredibly hot down here. It's coming. It's coming, <laughs> man. I, I just, I look at the 10-day forecast sometimes. It's like it's going to be 80s and 90s for the next couple weeks now it seems like yeah yeah um, and as we're talking days <laughs> it'll be a few weeks uh, until this airs but um as we're talking it was just a week ago or so they had the celebration in paisley park and all that so sure. we're just uh coming out of that uh celebration era as we talk and um so glad you could join the show uh, viewers are going to love it as much as i know i'm going to so thanks michael thank you glad to be here um as you mentioned, from Minneapolis and uh, living there still, how did you come up into, you know, being so into music and white drums? Uh, well, I, I'm the youngest of four, and there's an eight-year gap between me and my youngest uh, older sister. So a lot of people, everybody in my household had developed their taste by the time I got, <laughs> I got here, you know? So it, the music was just all around, and and different kinds of music. I mean, the, my sisters didn't all necessarily favor each other's style. Uh, my oldest sister, Sandra, was like way into Stevie Wonder and Sly and uh, Aretha Franklin. But my uh, my two other sisters, Sybil and Carla, they listened to like uh, Parliament Funkadelic and but like Heat Wave, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes and all that. But then my dad was feed me a steady diet of Ray Charles and Al Green and Ramsey Lewis, Shirley Scott, you know, uh, and also he had very eclectic tastes. He would listen also to, um, I mean, like the, the soundtrack to Dr. Zhivago and uh, George Shearing and, you know, like it's just all over the map. And, uh, but we, they moved from Bogalusa, Louisiana to Minneapolis uh, my, my dad moved here to get his doctorate in, in his PhD in science. And um, so they had all their records and whatnot. But for me, it's like if I was left to my own devices with the radio, all I had was 
FM album rock. So, you know, I, Led Zeppelin, The Who, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, ACDC, you know, just corporate album rock. So you mix all that up and then you get you get what you're looking at. <laughs> That's great. It's a melting yeah. pot, this stew, you know, and then you yeah. distill it out and bring it together into something beautiful and original. Yeah, and which um, made it made it a perfect situation for me uh, once I met Prince because, as you well know, like his musical palette goes all over the place. So, uh, the fact that I was versatile played to, to my advantage. I imagine it, it did for sure. Yeah. And who are some of your uh, drumming heroes as you were coming up? Oh man, I, there's so many. I mean, top I, top know, five maybe. Well, I mean, I, if I go from like levels to from my levels of maturity as a musician you'd have to start with the flashiest you, you know like <laughs> you'd have to start with like peter chris N neil pert uh you know like people like that or billy cobham or you know and as i got you know further along i think i was listening to the radio one day and when the levy breaks came on mm -hmm. and you know bonham changes everybody Ooh. Boom, yeah. John Bonham changes. You don't even have to even have to be a drummer or a musician to understand that you're in the presence, you're listening to something, you know, otherworldly when that guy's playing. So that was, you know, there. that was one quantum leap. And the next quantum leap was when the David Letterman show started uh, in like 1981. And I, you know, I never had a curfew or a bedtime when I was a kid. So I'd be up as late as I wanted, just like, you know, listen to the radio or watch a TV. And Letterman comes on. I'm like, who is that drummer? <laughs> that guy is cool. It's Steve Jordan. So, you know, that sends me on this whole other tangent through like the jazz fusion world and, you know, all of that. Omar Hakim, uh, you know, uh, John Robinson, uh, Charlie Drayton, all these other, you know, this other level, Steve Ferroni. Once I figured out that's who I was listening to, it was like, okay, I got to get more of that. And then when he made the transition from the R&B world, basically, to playing with the Heartbreakers, it was just like, yeah, okay. Well, yeah, there you go. That's, you can do it all if you know it all. You know, so I think I, I, I those were the next you know, cats that I looked up to, Dennis Chambers. I have his phone number in my in my phone, but I I'm every time I get ready to dial, I get slightly intimidated. Y you know, if I were to be one hundred percent honest, he's the nicest guy you ever want to meet, and he's never been anything but kind to me. But it's just like, uh, what am I doing calling that man? Hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I don't know where I'm really headed with all this i'm just saying like i i a lot of cats have been game changers for me i mean ringo even once i understood what was really happening ringo St stan lynch the predecessor uh to, to steve ferroni and the heartbreakers incredible drummer everything i really learned about rock drumming i could say was just ringo and stan lynch beyond that i i don't really need to uh, any more vocabulary you know, it's it's all right there. If I want to push the envelope, I can do that. But as far as what you need to set a song up for better things and not be focused on your own ego or how many licks you're getting in, those guys did what, what was necessary. They laid the bed and they pushed the arrangement along. And it's, you know, I, there's an art to that. So, and, 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 they, and they understood Pocket, too. Well, yeah, yeah, automatically. That goes yeah. with it without saying. <laughs> Whatever you do, you better do it in time. <laughs> so, Michael, um, coming up, though, in that part of the country, uh, you know, as, you know, Prince was gaining fame and the time and all that and the whole scene, Jam and Lewis, um, how tuned in to that were you and what influence did it have on your life before connecting with Prince? <laughs> People were always trying to force feed me Prince's music. And I really wasn't interested. 
I, you know, it, I, first off, the, the I was too immature to realize that just because you're local doesn't mean you don't have real value, <laughs> you know? Like, I thought, well, he's from here. Like, what? So, big deal, you know? And I, I you know, I guess I, I didn't grow up in a s strict religious home, but I've had a relationship with Jesus Christ since I was a kid. So, I can't say that you know, his output was something I gravitated towards. It, you know, Prince liked to push a lot of buttons and break a lot of barriers. And um, I found it off-putting at first. Uh, so, but friends kept coming over and playing me his records. And I'm like, you know, I slowly kind of, you know, oh, okay. It was uh, the first record that really made me kind of go, wow, uh, this dude is really doing something else. Was, um... Parade under the Cherry Moon soundtrack. Um, the musicality and the expansion in the harmony and his work with Claire Fisher and all of that, it just spoke to me. It just, I'm like, wow. It's because Claire Fisher don't care about rules. The parallel fifths, whatever, you know, it's like he he's painting, you know. And uh, it's funny because um, I remember bringing up something about Claire Fisher's work to Prince one day in rehearsal. He was like, you know, he didn't come up with all that. <laughs> I, you know, I would send him keyboard demos of what I wanted to hear sometimes. Like, Prince didn't want you thinking, <laughs> you know, that, that somebody else was, you know, was being great when, and, you know, when it was him being great. So <laughs> he corrected me on that. Mm, no, no, no. <laughs> I told him to do that. <laughs> that's hilarious oh man i mean it, it was it's it, he was cute like that <laughs> so what 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 was your band and uh experience and did you do any professional recording or touring before connecting with prince uh <laughs> yeah i mean speaking of the david letterman house man the first time i ever was on a on, a, on an airplane i was sitting next to ricky peterson who's uh very sought after keyboard player. I think he's playing with Stevie Nicks now. But uh, when I met him, he was playing with Hiram Bullock. And uh, I was in a band with Ricky's sister, Patty. And we were playing uh, like a Wednesday night downtown Minneapolis. And Ricky had been in the studio with Hiram. Hiram was in town. And those two came over to the gig after they finished up at the studio. And we had been playing, we were playing a couple of Hiram songs and it was like, oh, well, okay. And Hiram's like, oh, y'all know that? All right. He got up on stage and we started playing and he kept looking back like, all right, man. Yeah, listen to this kid. I was probably 16, 17. Hey, yeah, this kid sounds all right, man. How old are you? You know, and um, Charlie Drayton was uh, supposed to be doing some upcoming shows with him. And they were he was at the studio also, but he didn't come down to the show. Um, but he was... Uh, he got an offer to go out with uh, with the headhunters, with Herbie. So he took it. <laughs> and Hiram had a few gigs on the on the on his schedule he still needed to cover. And that experience led to him asking me to do this little little set of shows. And um which included a hometown show at the same club where we met. So <laughs> so I, not only did I get to get out to New York and play at McKell's on 97th and Columbus and, you know, suck up all that good energy and meet like Terry Lynn Carrington and like David Sanborn was hanging around. I got it sopped up that good juice. Then we went to uh, uh, Pittsburgh and played the Three Rivers Festival. And then we flew back to Minneapolis and I got to play the fine line. So I got to come back home in victory. Place was packed. And that kind of was like, you know, uh, an event that, you know, gave me a little more status. You know, not a lot happened between 17 and 19. That was like, okay, Hiram, you know, sorted his situation out. And probably, I don't remember who who got on the gig permanently. But, um, you know, that was a, that was a little little adventure and then um it was like well okay do I do I am I going to music school am I going to regular school you know because uh my father was an educator and he just didn't you know it's <laughs> he's like you're out there playing music having fun and you know doing your thing but you, you have to put your mind on more you know uh uh serious things practical you know? yeah music <laughs> is a good is good in moderation 
but you know you need a you need a plan you need a you know you need something to fall back on music can't you can't su survive uh, you know he tried he didn't really try but my dad uh played in church down south and he played two or three churches every sunday he'd just go from one to the next and uh he played organ and piano and uh but he also uh, had a job at like a department store wrapping gifts and he was putting himself through college at the time. So, you know, all my dad knew was hard work. So, and it, did, it appeared to him that I wasn't doing any, <laughs> you know, and once the music bug caught me, it was like, all oh, my good grades just sank, you know, after, I don't remember anything after uh, ninth grade algebra. <laughs> After that, music said, no, no, this, you don't need any of this. And I went, okay. <laughs> Flash forward, I'm playing at Bunkers. You know, I'm 18 going on 19. Prince comes walking in. So, I mean, that's, and that from there, it's just. <clears throat> well, nope. I, well, Ricky Peterson, of course, the uh, brother of uh, St. Paul. That's and, right. Uh, the famous Peterson family, all yeah. like musical mm -hmm. and royalty. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, well, when you're talking about your dad, I was also wondering, you know, how tolerant were they of you playing drums in the house? I mean, did they tell you, hey, cut that racket out? Uh, my mom did a little bit, you know, uh, and my dad would just get in the car and go somewhere. <laughs> or he'd stay extra, he'd grade papers at the office. You know, and it, <laughs> so uh, a little bit, but um, they were pretty tolerant considering, mm -hmm. considering they had no idea what was going to happen. I mean, I was playing in church prior to that, you know, with my dad, mm -hmm. but, you know, uh, music's weird. Music is like sports in that respect. Like you can have an interest and you can even excel, but deciding that's what you're going to do for your life. Uh, it's a big leap. It's a big leap. And it's a. Uh, and it's a, uh, what's the word? Like it, a lot of damage can get done, like physically, mentally, you know, with similar challenges. So my dad was really just concerned for my welfare. But the day that he picked up the phone, I, I had been gigging so much that uh, <laughs> my dad would pick up the phone and say, Mike Bland's house, because hmm. the phone, phone never rang for him. So Prince calls and my dad answers the phone. Mike Bland's house, and he, you know, on the other end of the phone, he gets up. Oh, may I speak to Michael, please? <laughs> and he looked at the phone and he looked. At it, I think it's for you. I think it's. I think it's Prince. <laughs> <laughs> After that, he never worried. He, he thought of. I, I, I'm sure he, in his mind he was like, if he's good enough that this dude is calling him, then you know, maybe he'll be okay. <laughs> without a college degree. Did, did he call, uh, did Prince call after seeing you in the club? Is that how the, how things transpired? Yes, that's exactly what happened. And, and it, but it, there was a few weeks between and a lot of speculation because there were a lot of people at the club that night. And so people were calling saying, man, we heard you got the Prince gig. No, I didn't get nothing. Who said that? You know, and a lot of friends go, man, I really, I really think you're going to get hired, man. I think, really think you're going to be the next two. I was, I, 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 I've, I've always been too uh, pragmatic to, you know, to believe the fairy tale. So, like, why would that happen? You know, I had seen Sign of the Times probably 10 times at the Uptown movie theater. You know, like, that's, you know. I don't know if I have a place in that world. I hadn't even really considered it, you know, but um, right after the gig, uh, Cody Anderson, a dear friend and the front of house guy for Dr. Mambo's Combo, he says, B, he was looking at your hands and it like, I just felt like he was connecting with you. He's like, I could see you were just kind of trying to be nonplussed and not, you know, I just, I tried not to act impressed. You know, <laughs> I'm casual. 18. I, yeah, it's Prince. Okay, cool. You know, I'm not going to lose it. You know, you know, he puts his pants on one leg at a time like me. So <laughs> that was kind of my attitude. And it again, I think it played to my favor that I was not, huh, who, huh, huh, you know, 
Yeah. People who are famous, they don't like that 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 high anxiety. You know, it it unnerves them. Prince the, Prince was always more comfortable around people just talking like regular folks to him. He didn't like to be put on a pedestal. So so what was the was there an audition or you just got hired? <laughs> Well, he kept coming down to that same club for a little while. It started sitting in, and you know, uh, uh, it, it really became like the talk of the town. The prince was sitting in with this band downtown, and you know, uh, he was putting together a new group, and so he hung out a lot uh, at at bunkers with us with Doctor Mama's combo, and then the Steels family was playing uh, across town at the Fine Line on a pretty regular basis. And you just kept seeing Prince. We seen him, they seen him. In the meantime, I'm meeting Sonny Thompson for the first time, Tommy Barbarella. They're both playing with the Steels band. So, and they're coming down and sitting in, you know, at bunkers and Prince, <laughs> un, unbeknownst to any of us, is looking at all of this and going, hmm, him, him, you know what I mean? Like he's kind of cherry picking and nobody knows what's going on until, you know, I got in a year before those guys did. Um, and then when Mika Weaver decided to opt out, um, I think in Prince's mind, he was going to bring Sonny in on guitar because uh, uh, they had had some, some static during the nude tour. And Sonny was playing guitar in Mavis Staples, Staples band opening for, for Prince on the nude tour. And uh, I, I had, had heard that they had given Sonny like a, like a, a little boom box and a tape of the show and, and a little uh, uh, pig nose amp and said, hey, you know, study up, you know, because Miko might get on the warpath and just go, I'm, you know, I quit. And we're in the middle of like an 18 show run at Wembley <laughs> Arena. So the Prince didn't want to take his chances. So Sonny was already sort of being trained in. And Barbarella had also been chosen to be the uh, the keyboard player in Mavis's band. So we were all, you know, it was always doing this, you know, and then Fink left. So Sonny came in, then Tommy, and the first real gig that the, that version of the NPG played would have been uh, at Rock and Rio, 1991. And that was still the new tour? No, that 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 well, that was how the new tour played like out. The tail end of it, yeah. The, the tour was over, and uh, actually, what really was happening, and I don't know how deep to go into the story because I'm not sure. I'm really not sure uh, about your um, your level of uh, like uh, like how deep it goes for you. Like, do you know about like MC Flash and Margaret Cox and all that, Margie? Well, Margie Cox was uh, tomorrow in the scene. That's right. But yeah. uh, the first time Prince saw Dr. Mambo's combo, I had been double booked. So there was a different drummer on the gig. Prince walked into the club and recognized Margaret from Tamara at the scene. She was also singing with Dr. Mambo's combo. So he invites her out to the limo and he gets, you know, said, well, what's going on with you? What happened with Jesse? What are you doing now? You sound incredible. And so... And he says, "This is a, it's a great band." She says, "Oh no, you gotta you gotta hear us from a regular drummer. He's this kid from Southeast Minneapolis, and he, you know, <laughs> you know." So that's what Prince did. He went to catch the band when I was playing with them. Um, wait a minute. What? Uh, anyway, so basically, after the nude tour, uh, we went into rehearsal for MC Flash, which was going to be Margie Cox's band. It's like kind of like Aerosmith with a with a woman singing. Um, and uh, that's when Prince really got to see Tommy and Sonny and I working in tandem together. And just one late afternoon, we finished rehearsal at Paisley and we were just getting ready to leave. And he comes walking down and opens the door to the soundstage and looks in. Hey, uh, um, you guys are still here. He's like, uh, do, you, do you have a minute? Um, I have an idea I'm trying to work out. And we all said, yeah, we weren't in a hurry. We were just going downtown to get some dinner and then go to a gig. Uh, so he comes in and we go all go back to our instruments. And it's just Tommy, Sonny, and I. And Prince goes over to um, 
one of Tommy's keyboards, and he starts, he looks at some notes he's made, and he starts playing, and just starts like, okay, uh, this is, Sonny, can you play this on the bass? Uh, something like this, and you do, 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 and then, mm, uh, da, 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 and Sonny, being a musical genius, oh, I hear the cycle. I hear where you're going here. Do, 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 do. And then you want. Do, 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 do. And then, do, 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 do. Times of pearls. Yeah. Yes. That, it all happened right there between the four of us. And um, uh, so we just keep going with this arrangement. We're finished with basically with the arrangement within 20 minutes. And uh, he says, oh, great. And we stand up and he's like, can you stay 15 more minutes to record it? <laughs> so they had instruments set up in the studio already. So all we had to do was just walk into Studio B. And um, and we were finished probably within 45 minutes. We only did two takes of that song. And the main difference was just that big fill in the middle. I had left that hole open because Prince didn't say do nothing, you know, while we were working on it. And so the second take, he made a couple little alterations uh, in the in the latter part of the song, and then he said, "Oh, that that hole in the middle of the bridge, uh, put something in there." <laughs> you know? uh, okay, all right, everybody ready? I'm thinking the whole time, like, what am I gonna do? That's a big matzo ball out there, to, you know. Uh, that's a lot of space to cover. It's a it's a whole bar on a Prince record where you're featured. <laughs> so I get there, you know, and I, what happens, happens. Perfect. Thank you, guys. And we leave. We go back downtown. We're at Bunkers. Here comes Dwayne, Prince's brother, head of security. Uh, Prince wants you all to come right back out to Paisley after you finish up down here. <laughs> okay, all right. So we go back out, and we lay the basic track for a song called Live for Love. Mm -hmm. So those two experiences you know, that day changed our lives. Live I mean, for love, man. Killer drumming on that. My favorite track on that record. Right on. You know what he, what he said? He said to me, he said, he said, play it like, um, like in time by, by Sly. Play it like, like that drummer. Like, you know, every time the hole comes around, do something different a little bit. And I really, I really hadn't my, 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 uh, what do they call it? Like my street level. I wasn't that, that, that far up on the like the hardcore funk yet. So I didn't know what he was talking about exactly, but he explained it to me in a way that I could get to it. And then I went and I, you know, I went to the record store and got uh Fresh by Sly and Andy Newmark blew my mind. I'm like, oh that's what that is. Oh man. So you know it's just funny how things work out. But that really was the nucleus of not the nucleus, but that was the retooling of the rhythm section for uh, uh, after the new tour. It became, you know, Levi moved over to guitar after that, and Sonny played bass, and Barbarella took Fink's place, and we all got dubbed a whole new name. Thank you for encapsulating that, Michael. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> I tried. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you remember, what was your very first performance on stage with Prince, though? Ooh. That would have to have been, I think, I'm trying to remember which came first because uh, right around the time I joined the band, Big Chick passed away. And Prince wanted to do a, uh, no, that was later. The first thing I did was uh, Saturday Night Live's 15 year anniversary. We played electric chair. And then Paul Simon, I think, played maybe Still Crazy After All These Years or something like that. That was, that was your first live performance with Prince was on SNL? Yeah. Before that, we had only shot the video for Party Man out in Culver City. Yeah. yeah talk about starting at the top. Man. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was it. Okay. We're going to play in front of, you know, 68 million people. It's the season premiere. Of electric, Night electric live. chair crushed on that show, too. Yeah, I was I was too stupid to know to be, you know, a little less uh, bold. You know, I mean, it's, I, I guess it paid off. It's just the fact that we live in a cornfield here. It kind of renders you uh, 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like you're just not. It's hard to impress a, a Midwesterner. I, I guess uh, that's how it's I like feel. Like the show me it. mentality. Yeah, kinda. You know, and also you know, it's like Dave Perner actually has educated me about like the uh, the reputation of the of the no fly that or the uh, what is it called the fly the flyover zone. You know, just all this flat land in the middle that people in L.A. and in New York think is, you know, nothing is happening. Yeah. This is a flyover zone, Minneapolis and all that, Iowa, Wisconsin, the Dakotas. Just get over it, you know. just It's just there to be passed over. So well, let, let me ask you, what, what was your early impressions of, of Prince as just a, a character and also as a talent? You mean once I got to meet him? Yeah. Wow, I, you know, uh, I came at him just like a like a normal person. So that's what he gave me in return. He was just kind of he wanted to formally fo formally sit in with uh, Doctor Mambo's combo. So like he's like I, I I'm gonna bring my rig and my guitars this time. So you know, like here comes his road case in with like six guitars, you know, and his gigantic stack. And his and his guitar tech and his security, and um, they're getting it all set up. And he's kind of standing on stage. It's just me and him. And he's somebody went to get him a soda, and you know I kind of there was a you know it was a little awkward at first, but then it's funny because I he was talking to somebody or he was he was listening to somebody speak to him, but he was chasing the straw around you know with his mouth like he was trying to, he was talk, looking at them and he was trying to trying to. <laughs> So it was just like, well, okay, he can't, he can't be, you know, uh, <laughs> you know. He didn't have an is, assistant to grab the straw and put it where. It's no, no, no. <laughs> it's just like, you know, it's just I'm like, well, if if he's, you know, I was just like, I don't know. My my thought was like, well, he can't be all that all, all that bad, you know. <laughs> he just we're just sitting here chilling. We're just having a polite conversation and getting to know one another, and he's chasing the straw. You know, <laughs> I don't know, man. It just was like he was. It felt to me like he was a he was a shy person, but he was curious about me. Um, like he really was like like he was trying to see into me a little bit, you know. And I understand because um, uh, working with music is an intimate process. Working in music is an, can be a very intimate process. So I think he was very fastidious about the people he chose to have around him. And, um, you know, you had to have a, a compatible and flexible sort of disposition, you know? And I think that, uh, I don't think I was being tested. I, maybe I was being vetted a little bit, you know? And every once in a while, you know, for a little while, I, I didn't realize it until much later. It's like, we'd end up at the same place. And, you know, I didn't realize he was kind of spying on me. I just be like, "Oh, hey, Prince, how's it going?" Oh, I'm 19. Whoa. Oh, well, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and it hit me one time. Like, I think he's kind of seeing like whether or not you know he's trying to find out what my taste is. Maybe I got a drug problem. Maybe you know, maybe, sizing you, know, you up. Maybe I got you know I got four baby mamas. I'm 19. How much trouble can I get into? <laughs> but you know what? I've come to know quite a bit. <laughs> I could have been doing a lot of things, but all I ever was doing was playing music. So I think once he saw that 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 my work ethic was, you know, on the right level and that, you know, I was really dedicated to what I was doing, it just all kind of moved forward from there. And once you got in there and started working with them, you know, were you just very methodical and businesslike, or were you like at times like, wow, this guy is a serious, serious talent, maybe more than you realized just listening to records? Uh, wow. He was definitely a, a serious person, but he, he always had a strong sense of humor. Uh, you know, he would say things and he would, just kind of act out in little moments. It's like he was not this big bad, you know, or this little, you know, diminutive, you know, mean person, you know. Uh, at, at least that was none of that aspect of his personality had be, be begun to show. 
you know, just like the taskmaster and the, you know, the demanding driving, you know, which is all necessary. I'm not saying any of it to be uh, uh, offensive. What I learned from working with Prince was I, actually my ideals were all right on point. I was I was set for that course. I was already taking music much more serious than my peers. And I'm like, I need to be somewhere where I can learn and I can grow and, and get more. So he provided that. I was ready to get serious and he was he was already serious. So, you know. And did you do any of the new tour shows or you just did shows after that? No, no, no. I did all the all the new tour shows. You did, yeah. Yeah, once so. my uh, the first thing we did was the Party Man video in the summer of 89. September that year was Saturday Night Live. And then what happened? Oh, we go headlong into the shoot for Graffiti Bridge is what happened. And during that, the nude tour gets put together. So I'm in maybe two scenes in the whole movie, but I spent the entire winter, you know, in this huge warehouse in New Hope, Minnesota, you know, with George Clinton and, you know, Morris at the time. And, <laughs> you wow. know, and, a, and, a, and a ton of extras, you know. That was my day, you know, every day for like three months. And that dovetailed directly into rehearsal for the nude tour. So by June of that year, we were out and running. Uh, we were the first shows were like in Amsterdam or Rotterdam. Maybe the Ahoy was the first show. I can't. Was that was that your first time overseas and traveling like that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It was that was all a first for me. And uh, what was funny though was at, even at the first show, it was like sixty five thousand screaming people. And there's already people who've got signs, Rosie, we love Rosie, Rosie, Rosie. She had her own fan club before we even got on the plane. So, you know, that was uh, that was real interesting. It's like, how do they know about all this? You know, but uh, the new Power Generation single had been out. And, um, and she, you know, was the icing on the cake on that one. So just from that alone, they were all ready. Like, what is this new group coming, you know? So did, did you get butterflies or were you just taking it in stride? I got nausea. I, I looked out from behind the stage uh, while the first act, uh, while the opening band was on. And at some point, everything just looked like maggots. <laughs> like, you know, that creepy horror movie footage of just maggots. It was like a combination of that. And actually what I was looking at is like, my stomach just started to turn, but I got over it. I got over it, and um, that's that's the important part. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Yeah. So yeah, well, I didn't get to go on the graffiti bridge uh, set, but I was on the uh, set for the jerk out video at the time. So oh yeah, all right, that was fun. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, they, were, they were a lively bunch. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was great to see them back together again, you know, for that brief period once again. Yeah, definitely. You know, I actually went to like one of the only original seven shows uh, was at uh, the State Theater here in Minneapolis when uh, when was the record, record was called was it called Condensate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I actually found them a place to rehearse and uh, got to hang out uh, at the rehearsal and I, watching Terry and Jimmy work was an eye opener. Um, I mean, everybody was great. Uh, Jesse didn't show that day. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Morris was, he was cool. Everybody was cool. And um, uh, I just tried to stay, you know, quiet and just observe. And it was like, wow. Everybody left except for Terry and Jimmy at one point. And they stayed and they worked on an arrangement for some TV show. They were, they were going to be on some award show or something. And so... They sat there and worked out this little medley, you know, and uh, the sound engineer just put a, uh, not a cassette, I'm not sure what he was using, uh, some device, they recorded it, and, um, you know, they then they sent it to the rest of the band members to study. That's how they worked. But I watched Terry and Jimmy just sit there and say, uh, no, let, let's go here now. You know, uh, no. Well, if we do that, then we have to turn around here and and like they're talking, and 
Jimmy is doubling the the bass, the, the keyboard the keyboard bass with Terry, and he's comping with his other hand, and they're talking about it. And the and the tape, the you know, the gadget is rolling. I'm like, they were so efficient and focused, hmm. you know, which made me reflect upon what it really takes to 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 work in the company of a genius. You have to almost be a genius yourself to deal with people like like Prince. You can't if you don't because otherwise you're not bringing anything to the party. If you're an average dude, then your output is going to be average. And Prince was never that was that had, average had nothing to do with Prince. <laughs> that was that was not a thing. Well, well, with that in mind, what what do you think he liked about your playing in particular, or what you brought? I. I my my time I've been told is is metronomic. I'm, I, the reason he felt so comfortable unplugging the drum machine was because I I had been I had been practicing. I had been already doing studio sessions from the age of like fifteen or sixteen. So I knew how to play play to a click track and how to you know how to measure time pretty accurately. And right around the time I met Prince, my pocket was really tightening up. Like I was getting real real crispy with it. And I think that's what it was, is that I, when he played with me, I didn't drop time. I didn't, I play kind of like, like a drum machine with, with, with blood and veins. <laughs> I think, I think that's yeah. what appealed to him is that he, me and him, we agreed on where, where it was at, you know, and that's what it takes. It, it, it's, some musicians don't know how to count. And that sounds weird to say, but you have to, there's an agreement that has to be going on about how the things swing, like where the pendulum is going and how far is it going out, you know? And I have the same thing with Sonny, which is why the MPG trio was, if we had, we actually pursued that, that was going to change everything. Cause we, Sonny and I both have perfect pitch. Prince could walk in the room and just start playing and didn't have to talk about nothing. You know, we both just watching and listening. You know, so he enjoyed that freedom, but I, I think that um, I think it, it may have. It, it, I think Prince sometimes would uh, scrap ideas that would change, that had the potential to change his entire paradigm. Like he had a strong sense of where he needed to be to stay productive, and also, uh, and I think that's where I get this mentality. This mentality also is that. I never put myself in a in a place where I have to be reliant on other people to 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 get what I need, you know. Like I, I uh, self sufficient. Yeah, it's got to be. If it's not within my reach, then I can't control the circumstances. And I think that that only strengthened in me working with Prince. It's like I get that now, you know. Well, I always thought, you know, the MPG, as great as the Revolution and that Love Sexy Band were, I just felt like it was a whole, still another level with the MPG. And um, when he put that together, Michael, and, you know, Diamonds and Pearls came out and uh, the Symbol album, and it had that new sound and had, you know, the, the, the rap element and all that. Did he actually, like, verbalize it all, you know, kind of like what he wanted to accomplish, or did he just... How, how did it go in that direction? It just went. It, the thing, Prince's greatest gift, probably, I mean, he's like the P.T. Barnum <laughs> of music. Like, he knows when he's in the presence of something freakish, freakishly, you know, freakishly filled with potential and, and, you know, and character. He knows how to, his gift was the way he orchestrated us. I heard Diamonds and Pearls for the first time a couple months ago, uh, a couple of months ago in a long time. And it hit me. I'm like, wow. Listen to what he did. He found a place for everybody in the new band. Just in that one track. It's like, that's on the border of being some like art rock, you know. It's 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 almost like yes or um you know what I'm saying? Like that whole bridge, or it's like Queen or something. Doo -doo 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 -doo. It's an or orchestral, yeah, yeah. It's it's orchestral, but it's driven by, you know, rock instruments, rock, you know, drums, bass, guitars. But uh, what a bold statement to make! 
And then on top of all that, once Rosie comes in, it's over. He he knew how to perfectly utilize every one of us. You know what I mean? And not only that, it's I really learned from watching your interviews with uh, with with Matt Fink and Lisa Coleman how much he had to do the heavy lifting by himself at the beginning. Mm. You know, it's and and I mean it's to to hear that he almost did like controversy and 1999 completely on his own, like just like <laughs> finishing 1999, like, oh, well, here's the record. Now let me show you what you need to play. That's, you know how high you have to, where, where you got to be on the spectrum? <laughs> how much dysfunction is going on in your system to even be able to do that? It's, I'm, he's dead and I'm still astounded. I'm finding out new information all the time. It's like, you mean to tell me that he, it was like, uh, I mean, it was like a, a musical God complex kind of, you know what I mean? It's like, I'm going to build a, you know, I'm, I'm going to build a town and I'm going to give everybody an identity and they're going, you know, this is how the town is going to work. You know what I mean? It's a, like yeah. Playmobil or something. <laughs> well, a blessing and a curse that he could do it all. And sometimes to, uh, detriment i guess if you do too much you know you got to find a balance yes and i feel like now that i have that perspective and i know that wendy and lisa had a, a real you know big influence on things probably uh more so like on like parade and i know in the sign of the times and probably during uh, around the world in the day uh they probably came on a bit more strong but uh for Prince to call me in the studio to replace his drum track because he don't like how he sounds on it. Like he hears me and not him. That's a compliment of the highest order. I did not realize until recently how much we were, how much space we were given. Like he would rather track it. Let's track it together. Cause then it's, it's down, you know, and we were, our retention skills and and uh, and execution was fine tuned. He learned that on his first, you know, experience with Tommy and Sonny and I in the studio. Levi was just like us, <laughs> so you know, like Cream, the rhythm track for that. That's everybody playing together. You know, uh, almost every song on that record, it was the full rhythm section. You know, Prince would go back and overdub his guitar or, you know, do his vocals and whatnot. And Rosie was often on vocal rest because he probably was wearing her out, you know, all night uh, in the studio doing other things. So she often slept while we were working. And then he'd work with her separately just to retain the integrity of her voice. So, uh, but that's, you're hearing the band. you And I'd say that's, it was a quantum leap. I mean, how much it was he totally new us. for for him. After all he had done, it was yet something new again. He finally found a group of musicians who could keep up with him and distill his ideas quickly enough to not cause frustration. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.